I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. The red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fangs, claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. There was something I was going to lead this episode off with, but I yeah. forgot. There's, um, it, that's most of my week. I was like, oh, I'll talk to this with John. And then I just forget. And then right before, like, as we get set up, I just open a notepad document now trying to <laughs> remember things. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I finally saw the Blair Witch Project. You, I For the first I, time? Yes. I have literally never seen the Blair Witch Project until last week. That's, that's not a joke. I don't know how that happened. That's like a thing. And I, I don't know if it's a thing for our area, but I feel like that's just something everyone's watched. I, I might have a controversial opinion. Is it? I don't think it would hold up if you watched it now. I think that's very much a product of its time. Yes. Well, that's one of the things, but I also think that the re- the like sequel that got released in 2016 yeah. is like strictly better than the first movie. I never saw the sequel. The sequel's pretty decent. I mean, Shoot. it's kind of the same movie, but yeah. they do also like play around with drones and GPS and shit like that. Although, oh, fun. There is a negative in that they show like a weird distended monster in it. Yeah. Which I feel like kind of undermines the whole point of the Bear Witch Project, but whatever. Kind of the first one, at least. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, so I got to go to my, so my brother in law is opening a bar, um, in Kingston, and it's nice. And, and um, so yesterday, what we did is he had like a soft opening that's just friends and family. They're not fully set up with everything, but it was an opportunity for like the family to meet the staff and and whatever. You yeah. It was fun in in my uh. My daughter got to run around and have fun and they have, or they're going to have the best way to do last call ever. Cause usually okay. it's like, usually lights come on, music comes off and you know, all right, they're wrapping it up. They're going to put cookie dough in the oven. So when you smell fresh cookies, that means it's last call. And if you're still there at closing, then you just get a cookie. <laughs> If you're still there closing, it yeah. turns into a burnt cookie smell to yeah. scare you away. It just fills with smoke. It, it gets increasingly hard to breathe until you pass yeah. out and you appear in the street. <laughs> uh, did I talk about Hell Let Loose? I don't remember if I talked about what? it. Hell Let Loose. So Why does Hell Let familiar? Loose is a game that just went on oh. sale on Steam. Where I think you just started playing it. Yeah, I think you started playing it after uh, after the last episode. It's so good. It's like a hundred person huge map version of like um, Medal of Honor, but there's no HUD. You can only talk with like your squad mates, and it's all it's heavily like communication based. The sound design and effects in it are fucking crazy. Like it's you get like startled in the game. It's so good, and it also has like really interesting. Um, transactions with other players in that um uh you just hear like crazy shit for no reason or like we had a uh and it's always funny because squad communication is usually just like call outs of you know what you're gonna do and where shit is or what resources you need but Mm -hmm. then there'll be like a guy in the middle of the road he's down the uh, and a guy you know, there's a satchel charge on the tank that's driving towards that guy. Everybody clear the area, and the medic's like, "Stay on there, buddy. I got it." And there's some guys yelling like, "I said clear the road." He's like, "I can make it. I can make it." And then he just explodes, and he's like, <laughs> "I don't got him. <laughs> I didn't get him. I didn't get him." It's very oh, good. No. It's it's been eating my time. The games are like an hour and a half sometimes. <laughs> I can believe that. It's it's simulator stuff. The only yeah. problem I have with World War II games, and this is this is my major problem with World War II games. Yeah. Most of the time, one person's going to be the Nazis. There's, well, I mean, there's three factions, so that means in, like, a portion of the games you're playing, half the people have to be the Nazis. I'm going to assume it's allied Nazis and uh, USSR. Italians. Oh, USSR. 
Yeah, so it's the the Allies, the USSR, and the uh, the German. Oh, you know what? That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, it's very good. They got night modes. They got big old maps. You can do the D Day. That's fun. It's like if uh, you you can a get PTSD game like that in the game. I'm assuming. No, like playing it, you're like you just start like twitching at shit. <laughs> It's, 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 I recommend it. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if that's technically PTSD. I think that's just that's, like your brain getting used to it. Yeah. Well, that, that, that I didn't mean it in a, in a, 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 a literal sense. <laughs> oh man. Uh, oh man. Have, have you listened to any on, oh no, Ross and Carrie? That just reminded me because like Carrie Poppy's doing a, uh, uh, um, a book about trauma, and yeah. they just got done with like a thirteen episode series about Noah's Ark. They, but, I have not listened to it in a while, but I was going through my podcast list, my things of, that uh-huh. I listened to. I went, oh, I haven't listened to that in a while, and I saw like an episode eleven or something come out, and I was like, oh god, okay, maybe I won't start again on this one. <laughs> well, they, they, um, they, uh, what happened was there was like a, um. This is really great content talking about other podcasts. Uh, there was like a, a homeschooler convention thing, which yeah, already, already like red flags, right? Like <laughs> yeah, starting off on the wrong foot on that fucking one. flags. Like that's that. If if you if you see like homeschooler convention in the like, if homeschooling is in the title of your convention, that's a red fucking flag right there. Just yeah, like. Nothing else, nothing else in there. It just says homeschooling might be a red flag. Um, so, so it, it was, it was run by Answers in Genesis. Uh huh. Which is, uh, for people who don't know, a very like, it's a creation, it's a biblical creationist group. And when I say biblical creationist, like, what is written in the Bible in the first 11 chapters of the Bible are is taken all as solid fact. Like, no metaphor, no nothing. This literally happened this way. Um, which, whatever, whatever. I'm not even going to get into that. There's, I, but, I just uh, popped on their website to, uh, to click around. So, <laughs> and it's, oh, fake. it's well, actually the design's not terrible. It looks like you could buy a CPAP machine from them. Wait. Help us share God's truth. Now, when you Wait, say... it says give now. They made $17 million in donations from a $20 million goal. Holy shit. I don't... I, I totally believe that. Um, look up Ark Encounter, because that's the thing that... That's the place that this thing happened at. Is that the big... That is yes. the thing I'm thinking of. Okay. Where they, yes. ma- they made an actual Ark. Yeah, like... An actual arc that would probably never in a million years actually stay together. Let's be real. It's, I mean, yeah. It's it's funny because oh. originally, so, originally they had animals on the arc. Yeah. Right? Like real um, ones? Because yes. I saw the inside, but with like, not real animals. Yeah. So, originally they had real animals on the arc for a bit. Um supposedly those animals were like um were supposed to be like you know temporarily there right not like yeah. permanently there and they took them off eventually but uh and i i kind of side with uh carrie poppy's assessment of this where yeah they probably realized it's fucking miserable to have a bunch of animals in a wooden structure uh and have to take care of them it's probably the worst. They have an education tab. They're uh Yeah, they do. The explorer join us for engaging hands on science as students explore a variety of topics through biblical worldview. And they're doing STEM stuff. Yeah, so their like conception of science is like uh completely flawed. Um in a way that like is hard to articulate how flawed it is. Yeah, well, it's participate in a friendly competition with others who love God's word. It's not the, but it's, 
that's not inherently it's i can see there's directions they could go and i feel like those are the directions they're going to go yeah they do don't every everything that you think yeah it probably happens there's okay good they 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 there's there's one thing about like okay so this is the most wild thing to me right so Uh uh-huh you've heard of the tower of babel right obviously the tower yeah 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 or Tower of Babel, whatever, however they pronounce it, um, which is ironic because the the story, because like, whatever. So it's it's like this build, like the idea is, it's a building that they were building, and it was getting so tall that it was like scaring God that like, oh wow, if they can do this and work together like this, they can like blah 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 yeah. blah. Um, which in that in that story, there's an implication of like more than one god because the language that's used um implies yeah. like a, a a pantheon almost right um but we won't talk about that right now uh which i do want to like point out that like if you read the new test the old testament there is a lot of stuff in there that like implies the idea that it's not monotheistic um but whatever um <laughs> <laughs> so so uh the idea of that story is like people are working together too well so yeah. then god punishes people by <laughs> splitting them and giving them language um yeah it's, he's 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 union busting yeah pretty much <laughs> it's it's one of the most bizarre stories ever because yeah because like part of that implies directly that like because of the like diaspora of languages and people that directly implies oh so god is literally responsible for all war cool <laughs> cuz that's the implication yeah that like people don't talk about but regardless regardless um luckily uh this week has nothing to do with creationism i don't mm, kind of <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not going to completely say it has nothing to do with creationism because there is yeah. there is the appearance of uh, of a type of saurian creature, um, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, instead, this week we're going to be continuing the series that I started a month ago. Right, that sounds right. Um, a, a dissecting Skinwalkers at the Pentagon: An Insider's Account of the Secret Government UFO Program by James Lakatsky. Colm Kelleher and George Knapp. Um, so, Brandon, do you remember what happened the last time we talked about this? Um. Oh, geez. Oh, yeah. I just looked down and saw a lot of uh, uh, acronyms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was essentially um, uh, uh, Bigelow used personal connections in Congress to have them set aside an amount of money which is uh, a 22 million dollars ish um for his own personal uh project yeah i mean like in the scheme in the grand scale of like money spent by the government not that big a deal no. in in the like realistic sense of like 20 what 22 million dollars is kind of a big deal um yeah <laughs> It's it's so weird because like if you talk about things from the perspective of government versus the thing perspective of like things from like an actual person, like what is and isn't a big deal changes so rapidly. But oh yeah, you're two completely different scales of yeah. of, of of you know measure kind of. You know they're 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 working in miles where we're working in feet. You know when we describe <laughs> things to each let's, other. Let's let's be honest, we're not even working in feet, man. We're working in inches. <laughs> In comparison, like, let's be real. Once you get to trillions, yeah. that's like such a huge order of magnitude difference. Yeah. Um. So, you y- you you were like pretty much dead on. Um. So what happened was, uh, Harry Reid, Senator Harry Reid, uh, worked. I'd say colluded would be the better <laughs> way of putting it. Uh, with Bigelow and uh, uh Lukatsky, who was a DIA. Uh, Defense Information Industry Agency. I don't know. I I have it. Is that Department of Internal Affairs or no, is it a defense thing? No, it's, it's the Defense Intelligence Agency. There we go. Oh, I had gotcha. it, I had it written down somewhere. Um, so Lakatsky, a DIA dude, um, 
uh, 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 Bigelow and and Reed. Also, Kelleher was in there too. Um, basically colluded, and that's that's what I'm gonna say. They colluded because, like, yeah, they did because they they posted a, a solicitation and then gave like two weeks or a month for people to respond to it, which is like not enough time. Um, no, not really enough time. Uh, they created the Advanced Aerospace Weapons System Applications Program, or as I like to call it, AWASP, because the normal, like, the, they, they did such a bad with the a- job with the acronym, but that's a whole other thing. Um, so it was a dark money funded program uh, to investigate unexplained aerial phenomena, UAPs, which is basically just uh, a way of saying UFO without getting your eye- eyebrows raised at you immediately. That, yeah. that's, that's really all UAP means. Um, <laughs> It started in 2008 and ended in 2010. Uh, the program, as I mentioned before, was championed by uh, Harry Reid, which is, he. I gotta say, he's in the running for most right-wing Democrats I've ever encountered, which is like, uh, he, he's, he's not alone, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Like, that's yeah. not a, that's not a, like easy victory he's he's in a heated run for most yeah. right wing so um there's also just I, I just realized the date range on that that kind of means like the ju- it, they, they really never like made solid progress <laughs> two oh, years yeah. is not a lot of time yes. on a project yes that, like like it it like they started and then it ended yes that is that is actually kind of important it literally it they have no time to do anything literally yeah right um i didn't talk about any of the position papers they wrote which were just like basically a bunch of like nonsense <laughs> yeah <laughs> they were like these nonsense like science fiction basically uh-huh. um like like i call it science fiction uh academy academics which is it's uh-huh. basically useless it's useless it was fucking useless um Anywho, so uh, basically what ends up happening is Bigelow wins the contract with Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies, which is, as we talked about before, more or less a company that buys patents and, like, access to technology and then pretends that it's its own by throwing, like, the Bigelow Aerospace logo on it. Um, <laughs> you know. Yeah. The, pretty much. Normal stuff. Normal stuff. Normal stuff. Um so, uh, during the events of AWASP, Kelleher was the deputy administrator of Bass, and that's one of the authors, Colm Kelleher. Um, Colm, I fucked that up. I said Colm was the defense intelligence agency, but it's Lakatsky. Uh-huh. Um, so, James Lakatsky's defense, in- uh, defense intelligence agency, Colm is working with Bigelow, um, George Knapp is just a dude off in the corner doing his thing just silently masturbating pretty much he well he's an he's he's an, a journalist um yeah he's a journalist who covers <laughs> aliens and ufos and everything so pretty uh-huh. much that's that's actually like i feel like that's not too far off <laughs> um i don't know i've never met i've never met a journalist who covers those things so who knows um Anywho, everything about the story is totally legal, but it's also, like, so fucking corrupt it hurts my bones. Um, but this week, we, we're not going to cover any of the uh, the inner workings of things. We might cover a little bit about how, like, it ended. Um, yeah. Which, spoiler alert, basically what happened was an adult saw that they, what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> an adult saw them? Yeah, that that's honest. Honestly, like, they don't even, like... I was reading through the the, program, the book and like they don't actually explain why it got closed yeah. down, but like everything about it reads like oh somebody was looking at the budget and was like why the fuck are we paying Robert Bigelow this much money? Uh yeah, like that's yeah, that's almost definitely what happened. Um, so so uh, this week we're gonna be talking about the high strangeness that the uh group research and occurred on what we refer to as the poorly named Skinwalker Ranch between September 2008 and December 2010. Um, now, uh, a lot of this actually, so like most of their, most of the like research, research. He's doing air quotes. Yeah. The, most of the like research that's in 
um, in this book, right? Uh huh. It, it it doesn't even really take place on Skinwalker Ranch. Um, like they they collaborate with Mufon at one point, which is the Mutual UFO yeah. Network. Um, I didn't I didn't cover that particular story because it's it's Mufon and like. We talked about it a little bit last time. Um, I yeah. don't want to talk They're about it. They're going to come up again at some point. They're, they're, we'll cover MUFON again. Don't worry. We'll probably, probably at some point, we'll even do one like that's just on MUFON because, like, there's probably a story there. Um, there's got to be something. There has there to be. not be. There, there has can't to be. not be. When you, when you can pe- spend, send an organization money and they send you a lanyard, um, I feel like, I feel like the second you get a lanyard from an organization, there's suddenly a story there. Right, because like, yeah. What? First of all, what's on that fucking lanyard? Right? Do we got like a, a Candy Crush fucking lanyard where it's like Candy Crush sponsored the organization? Um, funny story behind that. Uh, the first time I ever went to GDC, which is the Game Developers yeah. Conference, Candy Candy Crush Saga came out, and they did like a huge ad buy at GDC, and everyone was like, "What the fuck is Candy Crush?" Because it was before it became a thing. It was pretty great. It's pretty fucking great. There's so I did the thing where if I, I'm ever curious, or I'll just put in a celebrity's name or, or org's name. Yeah, I'll just do that and then controversy and hit search oh, and just see if anything comes up. And uh, how there's many, an article how, called "How Many Thousand? What if Aliens Met Racists? Mufon Resignations Highlight Internal Divisions in UFO UFO Sightings of, uh, Organization." Well, pretty much anyone who <laughs> who believes that the Nords exist. Yeah. Or the reptilians are pretty much just like very thinly coated racists. Yeah, but I like, guess someone, one of their, uh, uh, I don't have time to read through the whole thing, but skimming through it, it looks like someone high enough where you would like resign. So not like a you or me paying in, but someone like that's internal to the organization made a post uh, saying that Netflix is putting shows that promote white genocide out. <laughs> so that's. <laughs> Cool, cool. So he must be allied with the Nords. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, boy. Yeah, so I'm sure there's something on it. <laughs> Might be above my pay grade, if I'm going to be completely honest. Um, but anyways, for our first story, we're not going to Skinwalker Ranch, though. Um, no? No, we're going to talk about Where one of going? my favorite topics in paranormal lore. How the Dairy Queen Blizzard stays inside when they turn it upside down? It's just, that's, is that what you're going to talk about? It's just because it's got a lot of it's got a lot of ice cream and milk. It, it combines and it makes it sticky. Sugar. <laughs> it's not that hard. It's sugar. That's that's how the <laughs> that's how the DK DQ Blizzard does it. It's sugar. Um. No, we're talking about orbs. Woo. Uh, I, I think this is. I think the only thing I like more than orbs are um. EVPs, like literally. Oh, yeah. Like EVP. I think it's EVP orbs. Um, and then it, then it, then it just like all oh, fucking. <laughs> then house cats. <laughs> yeah, house cats. They're 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 like kind of cryptids. Um, so, uh, if you're listening to episode one thirty one of this podcast, um, you probably have heard of an orb. Uh, in this context, right, like a supernatural orb. Um, but if you haven't, um, and you're new to the wonderful world of orbs, uh, I'm going to just say they mean a lot of things to a lot of different groups. Pretty much whatever your, your like pet supernatural theory is, you have a different opinion about what an orb is. That's, yeah. that's not even a joke. Like literally every community has a different thought of what an orb is. They um, mean anything you need them to mean for you at the time. It it's kind of like um it's kind of like that mirror in Harry Potter, right? The desire mirror, right? Where it's yeah. like it shows you whatever you want. <laughs> That's an orb. I just thought it had some fucked up Harry Top Potter like alt scenes <laughs> for looking at the desire mirror that I will not elaborate on. <laughs> there's a okay, so. There's a lot of stuff in the Harry Potter universe that like has some really fucked up implications that yeah. um uh our resident turf never really thought about. Um <laughs> I mean I mean they had to destroy all the time turners because they were like, "Oh wait, 
if I don't destroy these, nothing matters. Yeah. Because I've I've added a device to the I've added a device to this universe that makes everything like retconnable. That seems like a bad yeah. idea. Anywho. Yep. So, um typically in in the general case, orbs are associated with ghosts and spirits, right? Yes. Um so you've probably heard a legend about them in some context, whether it be the spook light, the Marfa lights, Naga fireballs, or the most famous of all, uh, Will O' Wisp. Maybe Rudolph the Red yes. Reindeer. Who knows? Um, so long story short, these balls are disembodied balls of fire, light, or some kind of luminescent substance um, that people have attributed some form of will to. Right. So like a spook light typically is associated with like a uh, a train. Right. So it's supposed to be like this random person who died on the train tracks and like now they carry a light to warn people away. Or oh, blah, 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 blah. that deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which that's, that's the like good case of it. Right. Um, in the case of the will-o'-wisp, will-o'-wisps are like malicious and they try to draw travelers into swamps. Um, <laughs> and murder them dead, uh, by having them basically drown in the swamp. Um, yeah. Because basically the idea is it's supposed to be like, oh, it looks like somebody's lantern, right? So I'm going to get, like, mm-hmm. fucked towards it, and, you know, I'll be safe. Um, uh, in reality, like, these lights are almost always swamp gas. Um, yeah. Because they're generally cr- produced by organic decay, which is way, 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 way oversimplifying it, right? But, like, let's yeah. be real. This is an episode about skinwalkers at the Pentagon, not orbs. So, um, that's about all I'm going to tell you about orbs. Uh, there's also like, there's also a hypothesis that the reason why will wisps will the wisp sightings are less common is because so many swamps have been drained. <laughs> so there's less like opportunities for, for like yeah. the swamp gas to form and ignite. So- <laughs> which is is humans kind of, are extincting the will o wisp. <laughs> yeah, we we they they came for us, so we came for them. Um, becoming an endangered uh, uh, phenomena. They're an endangered spe- They're an endangered spirit. Um, but more recently, the context that you've probably heard of orbs in is ghost hunting, right? Um, yup. So orbs are generally associated with bright balls of light that sometimes appear on photographs. Um, according to Haunted Rooms, which is a website that I found that basically sells ghost hunting tours, which is to me still the most insane fucking thing in the world, but whatever. Um, uh, they call orbs, they, they say that jo- orbs are generally thought to be the manifestation of energy. Now, to their credit, they do note that such orbs can be dust particles, insects, or aberrations on the lens. Uh, okay. But they, they explicitly downplay the frequency of such orbs far too much. Uh, because they use the term true orbs on it, and they say that they have a uh, solid center and emit their own light. And Brandon, um, I didn't add this to the, the show copy, but I did remember this. Orbs, according to their website, have different meanings based on the color. Uh-huh. So what do you think a red orb means? Oh, John, are we doing red shift, blue shift? No. Oh, that would be, okay. that's too intelligent for what we're talking about. <laughs> um, a blue orb means that spirit has not come in a little bit. Uh, illicit calming or healing response in the case of blue orbs often indicates the presence of calming or healing energy or spirit. They may also represent uh-huh. some sort of truth, particularly if you're looking for answers or trying to contact specific spirits of the afterlife. Huh. Yeah. So, um, what Wait, do you think a white orb? What other orb? colors are there? White, red, black, green, and that's the ones that they list. White, red, black, green. They, how, who, how does a black orb emit light? It's a good question. Uh, orbs of the brown are dark hue. Okay. Which feels feels vaguely racist. There's, I mean, it's it's it's, it's 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 the supernatural community. Like vague racism is kind of like what they deal in. Um, yeah, I feel like half of those colors are just things that are present on night vision. Like that's just how they're gonna look. Yeah. 
Um, Although you're limited to the, the the range of the camera, never mind. I was, I was going to make a point and then I disc- discredited myself. <laughs> so they have an epi- black orbs have a reputation as being negative or angry spirits, but in reality, they uh, may be c- spirits with a negative or heavy emotions attached to them. Which I don't know yeah. what the difference is between that. Um, these are not evil spirits or energy. They are simply spirits with a lot of low or overwhelming emotions attached to them, which may be difficult to deal with if you are inexperienced. <laughs> There's. If you die without going to therapy, you become a black orb. Oh, no. There's a lot of black orbs out there. Um, They can be a sign that a certain place is not particularly friendly in the way of energy or spirits, but it's up to you to decipher those spirits or energies before you proceed. Uh, Yeah. There's a lot of it's up to you in here. White orbs are thought to be positive. Red orbs are thought to be warm and protective, which is weird because, like, I would think a red orb is, like, evil. Yeah, Um, like, angry. Like, that would be the first thing that I would jump to. Honestly, black orbs, I would just be like, why the fuck is there, like... Are we in, like, the 90s and someone's got, like, a fucking black light going? Yeah. Well, black Um, orbs have death touch. The red orbs are, like, they play aggro. You you know what? Green orbs try to build up and swing big. (laughs) Brandon, I just realized, as you were saying that, they do have the colors of Magic the Gathering. It's all Magic the Gathering. It is it is Wooberg in in incorrect order. It they have white, <laughs> they have blue, they have black, they have red, they have green. It's just <laughs> Magic the Gathering. This is just the mana. <laughs> this is just the mana association that these orbs have. Yeah. Oh god. <laughs> Oh, they came for my. They 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 keep going for my favorite planeswalker. There's Tam- what they do now. Uh, spoiler alert for March of Month, Ma- March of Machines. So if you care about that, skip ahead like fifteen twenty seconds. Um. Okay, I think that that's enough time for people to skip. Uh, Tamio's complete. Yeah. So she they was com- completed. They completed her, and yeah. now, <laughs> now she's basically rebelled against her completion and died because she was killed by the wandering emperor but like before uh-huh. she died she she like freed her story simulacrum version of herself so okay. she's not really dead she's just like a she's like a floating glowing combination of words uh-huh yeah also apparently uh having sex with with Jace Spellerin is like transcendental so who's Jake Spellerin Jay Spellerin yeah. He's the he's the blue planeswalker. Oh, gotcha. All right. like, I haven't played he, in a little bit, so yeah. the, the names escape me. <laughs> yeah, so he's he's that's weird. Um he's it's, got the D. Honestly, it was probably the most uncomfortable story I've ever read in my life. Uh, <laughs> well, because I wasn't expecting fan fiction, right? I wasn't expecting yeah. a sex scene in a Magic the Gathering mach- March of Machines, like the universe is being attacked by an unlike relenting army of machines. I wasn't yeah. expecting to hear about a Gorgon fucking a dude. It was a Gorgon? Yeah, because it was Vraska. So Oh. Yeah. So anywho, um Incidentally, Brandon, returning back to, yes. to the topic of this episode. Um the UAP uh community has also laid a claim to this type of phenomena. Um, As we can see in Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. Now, a thing that I haven't really talked about much, a component of AWASP was to uh, investigate reports of UAP phenomena. One such event was the case of Ron Becker, which is a false name, uh, near Bend, Oregon. As the story goes, the then 48-year-old man had been driving on Highway 20 for about 50 miles southeast of Bend, Oregon, one night, uh, May 1st, 2005. Um, He was driving a rental car with his daughter in the passenger seat that night, going about 85 miles per hour in the desert of Oregon, which I had forgotten was a thing. That checks out. So when I used to travel to uh, Pennsylvania for work, Mm -hmm. the guy that would drive would always get a Dodge Charger for a rental car and just get like this crazy expense. Like he had a really nice radar detector and we would just fucking fly. I usually, I usually, if I'm on the throughway, I drive like 75. Yeah, 75, 80. Like, yeah, that's that's just usually what happens. I'm doing crime. You can't stop <laughs> me. 
<laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I totally forgot. You'll for- never catch me in my Nissan Sentra or whatever. I forget what car you have. I have a Hyundai Elantra, so they will absolutely yeah. catch me. <laughs> in all yeah. honesty, my wheel will probably fucking fall off. That car's terrible. Do not buy my- a Hyundai Elantra. My uh, my Hyundai Sonata, <laughs> rest in peace. That thing at towards the end of its life, I had it floored, and I was like, "You can do, it. you're gonna hit fifty soon." Just like really, like just pedal all the way down, like you're gonna hit fifty. I I honestly cannot <laughs> recommend a Hyundai. It's it's like one of the worst experiences I've ever had driving a car. There's, I liked mine until it died. Um. Well, that's about all I have for it. I, uh, you know what happened to me? So, um, I was, I had been up in Albany for, cause we were doing something for Christina's birthday and we were on our way back down Yeah, and it started snowing and I, oh. I pretty much just had my butt cheeks clenched from Albany to Kingston. <laughs> um, Cause then it turned into rain because of course, yeah. Um, but but like I was, that was a stressful drive because that fucking car handles like a literal boat. <laughs> a sedan handles like a boat. Yes, it's oh, a gosh. bad car. It handles like a boat in snow. It's not good at snow. It's very yeah. bad at snow. Um. So, anywho, returning to our story, uh, dude's drive. Dude is cruising down the throughway. Or Hell yeah. highway, highway, I guess. I don't know if it's a highway, I don't know if it's a throughway, I don't know if it's a freeway, who the fuck knows? Anywho. There's some hair metal playing in the background. It, he's got poison going. That'd be cool, but I, I don't know. I don't think he's cool enough for that. Um, I soft top is down. I don't think he... Well, actually, he was renting a car. He might have had a soft top. That is a possibility. <laughs> Non-zero chance, and that's the reality I choose to install in my a, brain. A middle-aged man renting a car with his daughter probably rented a a dumb car. Like, he let's probably be had real. like a, a Chrysler Sebring. Yeah, it was probably something fucking like it was probably something mid-life pricey. Um, so supposedly his daughter was the first one to spot something strange. Uh, she uh-huh. saw three bright, br- bright blue objects in a nearby field, which, for me- for recollection, uh, ca- calming healing response if we're going by the ghost hunter's yeah. vibe, right? That's important to remember, because uh, that's not how the UAP community sees it. Um, There's, I'm guessing, desert orgy. Desert orgy? Desert. She saw some phone lights. People were out there fucking in the desert. That's what it was. Oh God, desert orgy. Oh, that's There's like... which. Be careful, snakes. Be careful, uh, sand and orifices. Go have I, fun. I feel. I feel like. Uh, I could be wrong. Bring but a blanket. I feel, I feel like the desert outside of um, Oregon and what uh, Washington is not as sandy. It's more like clay. It's more like gritty. Like, uh like a, it, it's it's like dirt that's just gritty. Right, you know what I'm talking yeah. about? Like it's there's yeah. a difference between there's a difference between sand and just like sand dirt. Yeah, sand dirt. Yeah. I I I'd, I'd classify it as like sand dirt personally, but regardless. Um so the objects were seen down, darting around each other about 100 yards away from the car. Um uh-huh. which given the speed of the car, right? The fact that she's able to track these orbs of light darting around each other, they must have been like cruising. Like absolutely cruising if these were like real physical objects right yeah um because which which realistically speaking it was probably just like a trick of the light right like yeah let's be real uh they said it was near midnight so like and assuming she had been driving like they flew in like because they had a rental car right Uh so like i don't know this 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 feels very like they could um, have been cruising. I've definitely been startled by reflections on my glasses lens before. Yeah. Well, that's also another thing. We don't know if she's wearing glasses. We don't. We literally know nothing about these people other than what I just told you. Um, actually, we do know one other thing. Ron Becker was apparently a uh, uh, a biotechnician or something like that. I think I have it written down later. Um, I don't know what that is. Like he he he's like a a scientist that deals with oh. Yeah, it's, or he like deals with like, 
Or is biotech like you're in the lab, like spinning the blood in the centrifuge? You could also be that. It, there's like processing a samples and. It's that such vague. It's such a vague title. Like, like that's that's the thing, right? These types of stories deal in a, like specific vagaries, right? Yeah. So like everything's super specific, but also super vague. Um, yeah. It's it's vague where you want it to not be vague, right? And it's um, specific where you don't need it to be. It's it's specific where it doesn't need to be that specific, right? Yeah. Um. Or where, like, it's impossible for it to be that specific. And it's bizarre that they are making it that specific. Because, cause honestly, like, biological, like, not biological, um, biographical data would be much more useful in a case like this than, like, uh, a complete and, like, 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 a complete itemized list of every single event that happened during a thing. Yeah. Um, because the, like, biographical information would tell you like a lot about like that person's uh like history what they believe what they think you know mm -hmm. all these types of things which it's much more useful when you're trying to determine whether or not a story's like has any chance of being true if there's no if there's literally no evidence for it <laughs> yeah because it's purely anecdotal anywho so uh the daughter who's not named sees these orbs flying around each other uh, they flew towards the car with two of the objects flying through the car, meaning that they weren't corporeal, right? Just full yeah. stop. Um, so two of the objects fly through the car. One passes in front of Ron on the dashboard, and the other enters his body. The orb enters the left arm, passes through his chest, and exited at the level of his right bicep. That is literally what they say in the book. Um huh. It is it is the most confusing description for me. I had to like read it like five times to understand. I'm and I'm not even sure if I have the right explanation for it right now. Right? Um as far as I understand it, it goes in through his left shoulder, leaves through his right shoulder. It's very okay. weird that they say at the level of his right bicep. Um I might have misread it, but it was such a poorly written sentence that I blame the sentence. Um cuz cuz like and and that's very frustrating because this is a scientific study and they pretend to be like super duper accurate about everything, right? And then like this yeah. one, this this thing that seems very important because you're hinging a bunch of like claims on it. Yeah, they're not. They don't have all the details. On it. Just so you know, syntax error. Yeah, yeah. So very good, very good, very good. Um, cons and also. To make matters worse, this was considered. This was gathered at least three years later. Because remember, this is 2005. Oh. And the program didn't exist until 2008, which basically means yeah. uh, any like specific data regarding this is basically useless. Um, so Ron Becker began to feel feel ill soon after this, feeling nauseous and terrified that they didn't want. To, so terrified that they didn't want to stop. Um, I will say, as I was reading this, I'm like, dude just had a panic attack. Yeah. Right? Like, I'm not going to diagnose him, but like, like... a reasonable assumption. Panic attack seems to be the the thing that happened there. Right? Um, yeah. Like, just just full stop. Anywho. Um, uh, Ron didn't slow down. Right? Takes him 45 minutes to reach Ben, because remember, they were like uh, 50 miles out. They were driving at 85 miles per hour, so that, that checks out roughly. Um... But they said that it seemed to take three hours, which huh? I have no idea what the fuck that's supposed to mean. Does the, it, like it just felt like a long drive after that? Yeah, like that's what I assume. But like they're also driving through the fucking desert, so yeah, yeah. it's gonna feel like a fucking long drive, right? How often are you driving yeah. through the desert? Never. Right? So like, like, like. like basically worthless like this is not lost time this is just people perceiving time time is a contract whatever um so that night when he gets so ron goes to his brother's house like that's the whole thing they were going to the brother's house so he could go to a conference over the weekend blah 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 um ron has a strange dream and this is a direct quote from the book <clears throat> he recalled an unusual face surrounded by light saying to him okay we are gonna fix this while a finger in front of him uh in front of the face, applied pressure on his left shoulder. Is so. Uh, uh, did did like an alien fix a blood clot? I'm not sure what 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 he's implying. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. 
because it makes no fucking sense given the rest of the story. Um, like really, the next part like that that implies that he healed something, right? Yeah. The next part of the story has nothing that would imply that anything was healed. So, dude slept for four hours, feels fully refreshed, right? Um, ready to attend the biotech conference. That's so I was right uh, during the weekend. Um, at the end of the conference, he noted that he had a rash on the left side of his face and that he was losing hair on the left side of his head. Uh, soon after, he went from 155 to 200 pounds quickly, despite exercising and not eating sugar. Um, during this period, he was also diagnosed with ductal carcin carcinoma in C2, which for those of you who aren't looking that up, that's breast cancer, right? Um, yeah. So uh, the book then goes on to be like, such a rare thing for to show up in dudes. But you see, the thing is, the thing about rarity, right? Rarity happens. Rare shit happens. Yeah, that's why right? it's rare and not that's why non-existent. It's rare and yeah. not, not like impossible. So the book in AWASP goes on to imply that the orb was the source of his sickness. But really, I don't see sufficient like causal correlation there, right? There yeah. might be a correlation that this event happened and then he gets sick. But that doesn't mean this event happens or this perceived event happens and then he gets sick because of this event. Dude's in biotech as well, right? So, like, who knows what types of, like, things he's exposed to, right? Because, like, yeah. he could be exposed to, like, any any form of, like, free radicals or, like, uh, like, like radiation in his daily job, right? So we don't mm -hmm. fucking know what he actually, like, his actual career is outside <laughs> of biotech. So we have literally none of the information about his environmental factors that would contribute one way or the other to this. He's like, I'd wear that lead apron, but it's just so much extra work. Yeah, I don't I don't like to have the dosimer on my my uh my shirt because like it, it just looks ugly, right? Especially when it turns red all the time. <laughs> um So anywho, it makes hay out of the fact that this cancer is rare in men, right? Um but I have a question for everyone out there. What's rarer, a dude getting breast cancer or an alien giving a dude breast cancer in a weird ball of light? I'll let you decide. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I'm going to go with the former. Yeah. Um, so uh, from there, they talk about, uh, they go back to Big uh, Skinwalker Ranch, right? Um, this is pre-Bigelow. So, in 1996, which is before Bigelow bought the ranch, the Sherman family is said to have had an encounter with a blue orb in May of uh, 1996. And I'm going to just say a warning. Uh, there is harm done to animals in this story. So, uh, just just keep that in mind. And they um, fucking deserved it. No. No, they really didn't. Those red bastards. Um. So, when Terry Sherman was outside with his dogs, he saw a baseball-sized orb moving around in a field on his property. Bafflingly, he had the dogs try and retrieve the orbs, which, let's be honest, Brandon, you don't need to tell a dog to go chase after a ball of light. No, they're, that's their thing. That's like their whole thing. They just do it. Right? Like, oh, shit, this one close. Yeah, like, oh, I'm going to get that motherfucker. That's, that's going to be mine. Yeah, so that three, that's their number. That, that that's got there's got to be a dog. Yeah. Have you ever seen those? Um, they're like these balls that have a propeller in them and some like LEDs. You can like toss them around and they like float and glow. I wonder uh, how dogs like that. They probably bite them, break them, and then uh, have to go to the the vet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> their stomach like, pumps. Never mind. Like that's that's pretty much what I'm I'm see like my prediction for that. Cats would be probably better to have around that kind of stuff. Let's be real. Yeah, um, that would scare the, the shit out of my cats. They hate things that fly. <laughs> There's, the, we had a balloon in the house, and the cat hid in the closet for a week. How and does like, it fly? We'd like hide the balloon and like f put her food bowl in the closet. Oh no! <laughs> oh god! It, it's like it's like explaining uh, uh, what you would call it, um. <laughs> daylight savings time like what <laughs> it flies how <laughs> anywho um so there were three dogs that terry had with him uh, uh -huh. and 
so the orbs evade the dog successfully because like let's be real if it's an orb of light at, realistically speaking at, at best it's just a fucking flashlight like orb um so like dogs dogs can't catch the orb it yeah. just it disengages from them disappears into some undergrowth dogs trail it dogs disappear in the undergrowth terry hears some high-pitched yelps followed by silence now okay he doesn't investigate that night but he goes back in the morning and he finds the following uh three round areas of dried out vegetation with three black greasy lumps in the middle of each circle the dogs were never seen again good so the implication there is that the orb burned the the dogs to death, like yeah. just incinerated them. <laughs> they um, got uh, they got they got mom and pop Skywalkered pre- right there. Well, well, it's a uh, it, it's Lars. It's not mom and pop. It's, it's aunt and uncle. Oh, sorry, aunt and uncle. Yeah. My bad. I now I'm not sure if it's actually Lars, but we'll say it's Lars, and then someone will correct me probably on the YouTube because that's where I get corrected the most. Um, <laughs> so, so bafflingly, Brandon, after this, the story yes. says the following. And I read that the first time I read this, I like made a highlight of it, commented on it. I'm like, the fuck? <clears throat> and this is a direct quote. Once again, the second incident on the ranch was much closer and more personal. Now, Brandon, what? Brandon. Yeah. Three dogs were apparently burned alive by these orbs. What the What's fuck? What's more personal here? <laughs> right? Like, that seems pretty fucking personal to me. Yeah. Right? Um, it, this this is like on in the running for like top 50 worst things I've ever quoted on this podcast. I say top 50 because there's a lot of bad shit I've quoted on this podcast, and I don't feel confident enough to put this in top 10. Um, But Brandon, the worst part is the second incident, no one dies in, nothing dies in, no one's harmed. I don't fucking understand how the next incident is more personal than three of your animals being burnt to greasy lumps. It's everyone knows their dog sucked. (laughs) Oh, that sucks. That poor dog. Those poor dogs. They're getting like, getting roasted in the afterlife. I mean, that's how they got there. (laughs) Roasted in life, roasted in the afterlife. Some things never change. (laughs) There's ashes to ashes, dogs to barbecue. Oh, no. So, Terry would encounter the second orb with his wife, Sherry, which, let's just take a moment. Terry and Sherry? To acknowledge the fact that a person named Terry married a person named Sherry and wasn't like, this is, this is maybe not a good idea. (laughs) Like, hey, we should go live in a sitcom. Yeah. Um, So, they saw the orb circle the head of a horse 100 yards away, which I have a moment here to say, why the fuck is it always 100 yards? That my That's, guess is the closest thing they can estimate distance to roughly that far away is a football field. Yeah. So they're just saying it's roughly a football field. But they don't want to say a football field for some reason. But they don't want to say a football field. Yeah. So um, as if noticing them, the orb rushes over to them, stopping 10 feet in, ru- in front of them. The orb appeared to be filled with two liquids and was emitting a sound like static electricity. Supposedly, after being near the orb, they became irrationally afraid of the orb until they scared it away with a flashlight's light. Now, assuming... I would say that's a rational fear. Yeah, I would too. Were that to happen. Yeah, considering the fact that that orb apparently flash-fried three dogs in a second. (laughs) It's... The two liquids are uh, uh, canola oil and barbecue sauce. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's ready it's not actually it's not actually like anything malicious it's literally yeah. just a dude's like barbecue that he let loose <laughs> yeah. right Someone like it's strapped a, a deep fryer to their drone and is lit that thing wreak havoc <laughs> <laughs> it's the alien equivalent of a deep fryer drone yeah <laughs> um so 
Uh, it ends the section with the following sentence, which I think is, it's a very funny sentence. Um, the couple later speculated that the blue orbs were technological devices that were capable of manipulating the level of human fear in the body. I mean, an RC car with a hand grenade strapped to it would fall in that category. It sure would. (laughs) It sure would. (laughs) So would a Roomba with a knife. Yeah. <laughs> These are all things that would uh, would contribute to that. Um, but I do want to take a second, Brandon, to note. I read this on the Kindle uh-huh. version. And okay. that section has been highlighted 156 times. Oh, Jesus. Now, I don't know if it was highlighted because of, like, for reasons like me, where I highlighted because it was probably one of the dumbest sentences in the whole book. Or if because people think it's important to look out for the like existence of fear generators, um, it's it was highlighted because there's 156 other podcasts. <laughs> that's entirely possible. <laughs> that's entirely possible. I hope it's the former, but like Brandon, let's be real. Um, I hope it's podcasters, but like, there's. There's a non-zero percent chance that it's not a bunch of people being like, I gotta watch out for fear generators. Yeah. <laughs> Government has access to them. This book proves it. Um, so, the book mentions one final orb encounter in their chapter about orb encounters, although that being said, there's a bunch more, right? Like, yeah, they're all over the place in this book because I don't, I don't fucking know. I don't know. I, I, whatever. Um, so, uh, this did actually happen during the run of a wasp and I think it's 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 worth noting because I think it's the only orb encounter that actually happened during a wasp right oh, okay and it happened to yeah. a person who who t- had taken part in the program Jin Costigan a US marine who was invited to the ranch in July of 2009 as a subject matter expert in tracking two months after the supposedly eventful visit um which we're going to talk about more in a second, uh, Jim would have an encounter with blue orbs in his home in Maryland while walking around the neighborhood with his wife, Lila. <laughs> All our cats disappeared, but we found some mysterious Nashville hot chicken. <laughs> There's something strange afoot. We got the, we have the cat fairy. It leaves the hot chicken for some reason in place of cats. I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> It's the weird part is the cats didn't eat the chicken before they left. Like, because that's the thing that probably would have happened. Um, that what if we have to, when we make chicken and we, we have to put like um, baking trays over it to hide it from the cats. Because um, they'll still try to get to it, but at least we'll have like an audible alarm sound. Like, we'll hear them batting at the tray trying to get it to the chicken. <laughs> the, um, what was it? What was the thing that you, you, uh, decoy lettuce? Oh yeah, decoy lettuce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so she she would uh uh go for that instead of the real food. Well, the, I thought uh, I thought the decoy lettuce was like the cat saw oh, the lettuce and was it. like she was like oh lettuce that's not for me. Yeah, never mind. I'm not gonna try and steal yeah. that. There's she's calmed down quite a bit, luckily, because I remember like after I first moved in, she would hop on top of the refrigerator, which you have to walk past if you need to make it to the living room if you're going to have chicken wings and watch TV, <laughs> and would kamikaze the plate, trying to bet anything off of it, so she could take it and run. Oh, damn. <laughs> Fucking cat. Jesus. Now, her eyes aren't super great, so luckily she had a low uh, success rate, but the, it, it existed. It was a low success rate, you know. But you know what? Here's the thing. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. You do. And when you do take them, apparently you end up, you know... D- Playing tug of war with your cat under a coffee table, trying to get that chicken wing back. Because mm-hmm. that's your chicken wing. That's not the cat's. It's my, well, it's because I wanted to eat the bones. That's fair. Because <laughs> they just chew the bones. I'm like, I don't want to deal with bone shard kitty cat. Uh, anywho, so we're in we're in uh, Maryland now, right? All right. Um. So. Uh, he's with his wife, Lila. They're walking a dog. Around 10 p.m., Lila spots a blue softball size orb, which is bigger than the first one. Remember, that was, that was a, the previous one, that was a baseball size. Um, 
So softball size orb um, hovering silently 20 yards away. It's, a fi- uh-huh. it's five times closer. Um, it's a fifth of the distance, rather. Uh, silently hovering uh, six feet off the ground. The orb then shot past the pair, grazing Lila's shoulder and evading notice by their dog who is with them, which I call fucking bullshit. Um, so the next morning, Lila woke with flu-like symptoms. Body aches and pains would persist until after a litany of tests, she was diagnosed with Hash- Hashimoto's thyroidosis, an autoimmune disease. Despite the fact that Hashimoto's thyroidosis is super common in middle-aged women... Uh, more than 200,000 200, cases a year. Jim is insistent that her disease is caused by her encounter, his, uh, her encounter with the blue orb that night, an encounter which he blames on his visit to Skinwalker Ranch. You know, it's better getting that than being turned into a pile of pulled pork. Yeah, that's true. I mean, those were the options. Yeah, she she ultimately lucked out on this one. Yeah. Um. Hell yeah. But there is there is like this implication between these the two stories where somebody got an autoimmune disease or cancer um, that there is like a radiation component associated with these orbs, right? Um, and that it's like There's, triggering <clears throat> diseases. I'm, I'm working on. I haven't written it because honestly, like after writing three episodes, part four, I'm like I'm I'm so, I just need some diversity. But um, there's a, a four parter I'm working on. Where um, they posit that aliens are aware they cause sickness in humans, which is why abductees report being in um, like s- storage tanks sometimes, is it's to protect, and that's what spacesuits the we- they wear might be, is to protect humans from any um, uh, biological uh, illnesses that they they could uh, transmit to us. That's fucking insane. It's just fucking insane. <laughs> where did they? Whatever. Uh, you know what? Whatever. <laughs> like, I, I literally... Dumb. Fucking dumb. Anywho. So let's jump back two months to July 2009 when Jim Costigan and uh, two other members of a military ma- team of military men uh, visited Skinwalker Ranch. The other members were Jonathan Axelrod, who is the leader of the group, a senior intelligence engineer at Naval Intelligence, David Wilson, a, sa- a sensor technology expert, and of course... Jim Costigan was there again, too, who we've already met. Um, all three of these men, to be clear, have read The Hunt for the Skinwalker before okay. coming to the ranch. Okay. Which is very important to remember. Um, so they're fucking primed. <laughs> Hell yeah. Right? Um, at the start of the beginning, uh, the author notes the type of night vision scope that they're using. Uh on the ranch that night and if you want to know it was a gen 3 itt um okay the person has a very weird the the author has a very weird like habit of being very specific about weird details um that's expensive yeah yeah not a cheap brand yeah that's not a cheap piece of technology you can get it used for two grand who remember the Um, fact good reviews 4.7 stars it's pretty good. I think I've used a Gen 3, uh, whatchamacallit, a Gen 3 night vision scope once. It's pretty cool. Um, regardless. So, about half a mile into their hike on the property, the temperature dropped from 75 degrees Fahrenheit to about 55, which is about, you know, 20 degrees colder. Um, for our metric listeners, that's uh, 24 degrees Celsius to 13 degrees Celsius. And if you demand Kelvin, just add 273, because I'm not fucking doing that. Um, so, uh, the drop was apparently not from the wind, but if they walked a few yards towards the origin, their origin, the temperature would return to the higher level. All right. So apparently this is like a cold spot in the wild, which outdoor cold spot, which is not that weird. No, it happens like it just happens. Move. Yeah. It's just air moves pockets, whatever, whatever. Could be like like they're just in the pat like near a cave or like you know any number of things. So yeah, it it could also be what time of day was it? Uh, right? Whatever it was like like different amounts of humidity moving. I mean that'll there's so there's much there's a literally of factors. there's literally so many things that it could have been. Um, anywho, 
uh, the tribulations of the trio would continue as anxiety gripped them 30 yards of walking after encountering this this temperature change until it escalated to mortal fear, prompting them to turn around to return to their base of operations. Because they watched a horror movie before going to a haunted house. Basically. Basically. Now, as they return, uh, Jim notices in the night vision a strange black, black oval about eight feet tall. Okay. 50 yards away from the trail. The other two men couldn't see the shape, but supposedly they felt that the source of dread was there, um, which I want to take a moment to call bullshit because uh, even if this did happen the the way they said it did, why would it peak after they pass past the object? Right? Yeah. Cuz like like if we're know, doing they're like they're they're Tanjiro and and just fucking only now smelled the number of humans this demon ate. <laughs> Somebody's been watching a lot of Demon Slayer. I uh, well, I blew through a few seasons. Uh, it it's pretty good. It's hard for me to watch it now for reasons that I'm not going to get into, but it's it's pretty good. Um, but like just doing basic trigonometry, right? Like that makes no fucking sense. Wouldn't you expect it to peak when they're like closest to it, like at a right angle to it? Yeah, I right? mean, like if if the sense of dread is something being emitted. By that from it, then yeah, which is which is what they're implying, right? Because yeah. the two who don't have night vision say that they they're feeling it come from that direction. Right? It was hiding its power level till they just passed. Pretty much, pretty much. Um, regardless, who the fuck knows? Whatever, I don't know. I also want to say, how the fuck did Jim miss it on the way in? Right? I'm assuming the dude's scanning with his his night vision goggles at all times. Because if you got a two thousand, if you have a three thousand dollar pair, and it's probably more expensive at this time period, it's two thousand nine. If you have a fucking expensive pair of night vision goggles, you're oh, always you're using fucking them. using those. You don't take the scope down. That's just yeah. facts. Not not even from a sense of like this is a thing to like. You finally get to bust them out. How excited are you to fucking mm-hmm. do that? Not even from like a, like a being good at your job thing, just from a being stoked to get to use these puppies. Exactly, exactly. How often do you actually get to use something like a night vision scope? No, like if I had that shit, I'd be walking to the bathroom with them. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh no, you'd you'd be wear you'd be fucking wearing that thing all night long. There's yeah no reason he shouldn't have seen this before, but whatever. Um, now here's where the things get really fucking weird. So. Uh-huh. The book imply the implication of this, as the book puts it, is that this object could only be illuminated above 850 nanometers versus the standard 400 to 700 nanometers of visible light. Um, uh-huh. It's been a while since I studied optics and light, Brandon. Uh, uh, but uh, I don't think that's how light works. That the object could only be illuminated above versus the standard of light. I don't know. But, like, I, I don't think that's how it works, because, like, that implies... Because that implies that smaller... Like, like or is it... That those would be larger waves, right? The... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... 400 to 700, yeah. So, like, why but, would... But, but, like... But, like, okay. So here's my thinking, right? A okay. a radio dish, right? Um, yeah. A lot of the times, radio dishes will be not completely solid, right? For certain circumstances, uh, but that's because the like the wavelength is so large, right? That it doesn't matter, or like the amplitude is so high that like it it doesn't matter. You don't need all that material to bounce the the wave, right? Um, so. Wouldn't a larger wave of illumination, wouldn't that, like, wouldn't, wouldn't you still be able to see it with smaller waves? I I don't know. So they're moving, I'm just looking at a chart. The um, visible light is the 4 to 800, and then when you move to the right of that, that's when you get to IR, which is infrared. Yeah. So then, the implication of a push that could only be illuminated above, so it'd only be visible in the infrared range. Is that what it's? Yes, that's what it's saying. But I just I don't yeah. think that's how objects work. I don't think that's how like materials work. 
I yeah, I I want to agree with that. Like like I just don't think that's how it works. Like full stop. That's all. Right? Like Yeah. It it just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I think the implication is they're like, "Oh, it's it's special technology." But like scientifically speaking, I don't understand like they haven't made an argument for how that would work to me. And if it was only visible in IR, would that not still block out the visible light spectrum that's between you and it, so you would still see a lack, like a thing. I that's what I think, but like I could be wrong. I I don't. It would be like what? Hey, what's that thing? That seems weird. It's not. It's also not so far out of the visible light spectrum that like I, I don't know. This this is very weird and doesn't make any goddamn yeah. sense. That's just at the end of the day, that's it. It doesn't make any fucking sense. Whatever. Um. So, regardless, nothing else happens on that trip. Everyone's supposedly jovial returning to Virginia and Maryland. Now, um, as I mentioned before, uh, Jim alleges he brought something home with him that caused his wife to get a fairly common autoimmune disease. Um, However, he was not the only member of the group to claim that the paranormal followed him home. (laughs) Hey, honey, look at all this radium I found. (laughs) Goddamn Skimwalker Ranch! I found this. You, here, here, touch it. There's th- play with it. This is really cool. It's, it looks like a metal, but it's liquid. <laughs> it tastes super weird. Weird. Have some. Have as much as you want. <laughs> um. So, uh, as I mentioned before, Jim alleges he brought something home with him uh, that caused his wife to get a common autoimmune disease. However, as I Herpes. mentioned, yeah. <laughs> oh no. He got he got a uh, skinwalker STI or uh, skinwalker <laughs> transmitted infect in, infectious diseases. Yes, skinwalker <laughs> transmitted infections. Um, <laughs> anywho, with the skinwalker ranch, they are not good kissers. No, they're not. Um, Jonathan Axelrod supposedly had an encounter just ten days after he returned from the ranch, so he beats out Jim's uh, two months. So around two a.m., Jonathan's wife Ruth saw a large black humanoid shape walking towards her in their bedroom. Hell yeah. Um, which to me is like basically just bog standard sleep paralysis. Yeah. Right, like whatever. Not Nothing super special there. Um, It did spook her enough that she turned on the light to see that nothing was there, uh, which would make sense if it was sleep paralysis. Um... So this was then followed by sounds of footsteps on the stairs, which she investigated, finding no one there. Both of her sons apparently being asleep in their beds, but who actually fucking knows on that one? Because uh, teenagers, they were teenage oh, yeah. boys. So like, lots of shenanigans. Lots of shenanigans. Who the fuck knows? I did lots of sneaking around stairs. Mm-hmm. I didn't, but that's because I was John. Um, well, a lot of mine was also like because my Xbox was downstairs. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, I did a lot of I did a lot of sneaking around the house while I was playing Xbox with the volume turned off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that that did happen. That did happen, and tried not to get caught. Um, and be like, John, go to sleep, and then I would have to go to sleep because I would feel guilty. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm John. Uh, <laughs> so uh, anywho. Um, this is such a benign story. I would personally never tell anyone about it unless I was like fishing for an amusing, amusing anecdote, right? About how like the human brain like fucks with you and like you know you're hyper aware for false positives because that's just like what evolution did to us. It's how we how we be do survive. That's how we lived, like literally. Yeah, otherwise we wouldn't have made it. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's it's beneficial, right? Anywho. So, uh, Jonathan would uh, go on to report that more activity occurred a month later, um, saying that things were getting weirder at his home. Not only that, but it was directed at his family, um, which I think everything has been directed at his family because nothing has happened to Jonathan himself. It's all like his wife and his kids. So, yeah. Well, also, if something's happening in your home, it's got like that's it has to be directed at your family. Pretty much. <clears throat> Pretty much. Right, because that's it. it, They're in the the house. Yeah, yeah. Um, So when he was out of town, his 16-year-old son woke up to have small blue orbs flying around his room, 
So I guess he's lucky that none of them touched him because otherwise he'd probably get like I don't I don't fucking know uh, blood cancer at this point. Who the fuck knows? Yeah. Um, so uh, he yelled for his mom. The orbs vanished. Shadow figures became common occurrences, and unexplained noise permeated the house. Jonathan and Ruth believed that all of this started after he returned from the ranch. Now, um, they do have a story that is uh, about at least the modern depiction of the Skimwalker in Western media in this this particular account. Yeah. Which I th- this is in two thousand ten ish two thousand nine, which means like. Nine, yeah. So, like, there were a lot of things on, like, sci-fi. Yeah, we're going to get into that. Okay, because I just want to say, like, while I, I don't personally believe in, like, creatures or, or things like that, if I watch just a thing on it, like, especially in that time period, like, I remember, like, I was terrified. I saw so many shadow people after watching one thing on shadow people that, like, freaked me out. Even, even if, you know mentally knowing that they're not there having that put in you that shit that that's not the yeah i mean we're also like like shadow people is just a thing that we see like normally so it's like not even that weird right yeah like we see that accidentally because our body our brains don't always fire right full stop yeah they don't they always fire right and it's always beneficial for like if there's a thing that's obscure for your body to assume that that thing is a threat. Yeah. Assume, assume that everything's going to go terrible. That's basically the basis of in- anxiety, right? Yeah. You're just, you're really good at surviving. That's all you are. Yeah. If you have anxiety, you're just really well trained. You're really well tuned for, for survival. That's yeah. a way to look at it. Um, so, now this is this is me quoting the the book specifically. Um, it was after midnight, and Ruth had turned off all the lights in the kitchen and was preparing to go upstairs when her eyes caught movement out in the yard. She walked over to the window to have a better look, then froze as she witnessed one of the most bizarre sights she had ever beheld. Standing upright and leaning against one of the trees at the perimeter of her yard was a huge wolf-like creature. It had long hair and looked like a wolf, but was standing on two legs. Huh. Um, the creature appeared to be staring right at her. Its gaze was not friendly. She continued to stare in the, at the eerie sight, trying to fathom the impossibility of an upright wolf-like creature in the quiet upper middle class <laughs> suburban Virginia neighborhood. <laughs> the creature then took one last look at her, turned and walked slowly on two legs further into the tree line. That, I mean, oh, that it's, there's a really great thing I'm trying to figure out how to put in chat. <laughs> uh, just will let me share JPEGs. God damn it. Uh, I'm thinking, like, my brain went straight to that cartoon wolf that wears, like, a hat. From? From some, ad, like, just a cartoon. I'm, I, I'm drawing a blank for Are you it. talking, like, Googled... Tex Avery type stuff, or? It's, uh, sure. <laughs> Tex Avery's, like, 50s, 60s. Yeah, well, it's like that wolf with the hat and the cane. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're talking something roughly Tex Avery-ish. Um, yeah, yeah, I can see that. I mean, it also just might be like, uh, this is 2009, so it might just be like a furry who got lost at a convention. Maybe. It's possible. Who knows? Um, But Brandon, that's not the last time they would see the creature. Uh, just no. three days later, at 10.30, Paul, one of the sons, would see a similar creature in the backyard. Once again, it was a huge wolf-like creature standing on two legs at seven feet tall, staring straight at the two teens, because both the teens were there. Um, the older brother, Michael, saw the creature as well. Suddenly, the, bo- the beast took off running towards the tree line, its long, black, its long brown black hair flowing in rapid movement. The beast ran it, easily and flew on its hind legs with long strides seemingly impossible for normal canine ata- anatomy. I gotta see this thing's hair, because they won't stop talking about it. It's apparently beautiful. That's all I'm It's hearing. just luxurious. Apparently. Uh, apparently. I, I, I don't know. It's Fabio the werewolf. Must be. Well, they, they would contend that it's Fabio the skinwalker, but, you know, whatever. Um, There's... I won't. I, I I I refer back to Skinwalker's Ranch episode two, uh, e- episode one, <laughs> where we talked about the fact that Skinwalkers are nothing like the modern depiction. Oh of yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, episode one. Yeah. yeah. Um. 
But Brandon, as an aside, you know what movie came out that year? Oh no. Twilight Saga New Moon. Oh, right on. Uh, you know, the one with all the werewolves? <laughs> yeah. So, there's that. Um, so, returning to the story, uh, I can't see if the mother had told her two sons about the initial encounter before citing it. But if she had, uh, I need to remind everyone, uh, it might have been a while since you've encountered a teenager, but they're shitheads. Yep. Um, and they would 100% make up a story to fuck with their mom. Especially if their mom told them about that first thing, they'd be like, all right. Well, now we're fucking with you. We gotta do this. Now we have to fuck with you. Yeah. Um, The implication of the story is clear, though. Mess with Skinwalker Ranch, get cursed. Um, But because AWASP was pretending to do science, they decided to give it an explanation that is one of the more pseudoscientific things I've ever read. So the chapter that this all comes in Brandon is uh-huh. is called Skinwalker or like Skinwalker sequ- sequelae, right? And a sequelae uh-huh. is like a type of disease, like an infection type thing, right? Yeah. Um, but here's the thing. So apparently, Lila Costigan was not the only person to develop an autoimmune disease. Ruth Axelrod also got flare-ups of both lupus and Raynard's disease, um, and her teenage sons had huh. flu-like symptoms. Moreover, allegedly, many families of people who went to Skinwalker Ranch described one or more autoimmune diseases, including Graves' disease, Surgeon Syndrome, Hashimoto's thyroidosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus, which I want to take a moment to note, all of those autoimmune disease are super fucking common. Yeah. Um, with, uh, uh, with one of them being, like, extremely common. I can't remember which one of it, uh... It was, but like it was like, like you know how how Google when you Google it is like common, 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 very common. Yeah. One of them is like very common, like two million oh, okay, cases good. a year. So like at this point, it's like I'd be more surprised if people didn't have family members that developed one of these diseases. Um, yeah, because like rheumatoid arthritis is such a common thing, right? And if if yeah. most of these people who are working on it are like middle aged, the idea of like a family member getting rheumatoid arthritis is not that weird. No, um, no. But the the way that like there's also this like implication that it's radiation, right? There's there's a bunch of stuff. Yeah. They don't elaborate on any of this, by the way. Um, they cite HIPAA, but uh. Given the fact that we've heard the medical details of a number of other people, some of whom we've actually heard their real name, uh, I'm going to call bullshit that that's the reason. Yeah, I don't think HIPAA applies here, right? Because if I tell you about a condition I have, and then you just put it in a book, that's not HIPAA. HIPAA also only... I, I, I was looking into this. HIPAA only applies to medical institutions, right? Yeah. Um... So, I, I don't know. It, it seems weird. I don't think HIPAA applies in this particular case, but whatever. They say HIPAA applies. I'm not going to fucking... I'm going to say that's weird, but whatever. Um, but yeah, so, like, honestly, uh, I, I, I think that's bullshit, right? Um, you can get you can also get a release from someone to, to, like, release broad demographic data without having personally identifiable information present, right? Yeah. So, like, all of this is... You like pointless, but whatever. Um, they also point out that the numbers are too low to draw conclusions, which is like, why the fuck would you even bring this up in the first place? You're yeah. not an academic paper, right? You're a book. Clearly, you want people to believe that this is a thing because you're mentioning, yeah, it, right. Um, so I digress. George Knapp alar- elaborates on this supposed th- phenomena. Well, yeah. So hitchhikers, beings that you being, so hitchhikers being that you take things home with you. Everybody took things home with them. I took it, things to my house. Things happened to my wife and to me in different places. So everybody took things home. But we don't. But we didn't know that. Gee, it was going to be some kind. Going to be kind of permanent. We didn't know that it was going to stay with you for maybe years or and years or maybe the rest of your life. Who knows? That's what he what? had to say about like getting infected yeah by like a paranormal sti um but actually this is a fairly common paranormal belief right this idea that you can bring something home with you it's been propagated by tons and tons of horror movies 
Um, as well as the mighty Boosh uh, in one particularly noteworthy scene. Oh. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, this book takes it to the next level. Um, Paul Axelrod, one of the two boys who saw the wolf-like creature, said that one of his high school friends approached him in 2011, telling him that he had seen a wolf-like creature the night before outside looking in through his bedroom window. Later, a different friend described orbs floating around the room. Supposedly, Paul had not prom- prompted this disclosure, although nothing says that he hadn't told them about his own encounter. Yeah. Um, not really, like, like, this is, like, secondhand, secondhand information, right? Yeah. And, like, a wolf, a wolf creature staring at you through your bedroom window is not that weird, because there's a bunch of movies with that iconography. Orbs floating around your house is not that weird, because this is 2011, and, like, this is height, this is, like, peak ghost hunters culture, right? So, like, nothing about these things that were said are, like, exceptional, right? They're not uh-huh. like clear, like slam dunk evidence of like, oh, this is this is like a thing, right? It's more like, oh, you you mentioned two like super common th- themes in like sci fi media of the time. Cool, good for you. Um, <laughs> but Brandon, the conclusion that the authors come to is fucking insane. Um. It's that uh, these per- the perception of these events is transferable. Well, uh, Colm Kelleher huh. decides to consider the phenomena using an infectious disease <laughs> model. I love how you said that. Phenomena? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I kind of... I, well, see, the thing is, I, I fumbled that at the first, at the beginning, but you know what? I just committed to it. Sometimes you do that. Sometimes you accidentally, uh, you, ac- you accidentally make a menomena version of like that song, like you know. Yeah. You just you yeah. just do a different kind of menomena. Um. So uh, I gotta say this is like complete horseshit. First of all, because it's not infectious disease, right? Because he like uh, he also talks about like, uh, he talks about like the the the, the, the um, uh, what's the term the the like transmission constant, right? Like the yeah the RO or whatever, um, whatever. But he also then goes on to mention that uh, the propagation of gun violence um, is an example of this in a social setting. Uh, but that's not super comparable uh, because in this case, a supposed infection is literally causing people to develop an autoimmune disease, not people to be psychologically affected by uh, talking about gun violence and then hearing about like people getting notoriety and being like, I want notoriety and I also kind of fucking hate yeah. the world, so I'm going to just do this thing. Really, apples to oranges. Right? Yeah, like, very much so. Very, very, very apples to oranges. But, regardless... Um, I just fucking hit my microphone, because I'm John. <laughs> Hi. I've done 131 of these. Um, so it takes a turn towards the even more absurd when Yuri Geller is called out by name. To suggest no. historic evidence of the transmission of paranormal phenomena. And I want to take a moment, Brandon, to point out that Yuri Geller was thwarted <sighs> by Johnny Carson in some silver film canisters live on television once. Um, yeah. And to be fair, that was James Randi's doing. But still, like, that's not... That's... I, it's I pretty... I love James Randi, by the way. And Yuri Geller is the guy that sued Pokemon because of... Uh, sp- uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank. Spoon. Kadabra. Yes. That's why Kadabra hasn't appeared on a Pokemon, didn't appear on a Pokemon card for like well over like two decades, I think. Which <sighs> is baffling because because Abra appeared and Alakazam appeared, but not Kadabra. There's. I'm trying to. I this. Uh, I watched a thing. I want to say Uri Geller has a car that he just has glued like covered in spoons. I saw like a, a somewhat recent interview with him at his house. Why? That's I don't dumb because as shit. he's already Geller. It's so dumb, especially considering the fact like anyone can bend spoons like that. It's so easy. He's still out there fucking Uri Gellering too. It's so easy to do. It's so easy to do. You just heat the spoon up. There like like if you have like a like a like a a, a pewter spoon, you just heat it up with your hands and then just kind of like It's not that hard pretty fucking easy 
I mean, it's hard for me, but that's because I have shit circulation, but that's a whole other thing. Um, <laughs> so, apparently, Jim Schnabel, an incredibly credulous person uh, for remote viewing, reports that while Lawrence Livermore National Labs, LLN, L, um, which I actually did some experiments with those guys, or not experiments, I did some work for them. Um, the, the, what is it? Uh, something Oak Ridge something national labs whatever project what? it's called coral what what's happening i uh i went to uri geller's website just to see what's going on and i guess he has an island that he's selling citizenships to for a dollar so if you send him a dollar he'll mail you an official certificate of citizenship on uh the most mysterious land in the world which is like a rock in the water Okay, so this isn't loading He's for me, weird. but where is this rock located? What the fuck? <laughs> oh, his logo is terrible. Become a citizen of Uri's mystical island. Lamb Island. Uh, existing in peace and harmony with all fellow Lamb Island citizens and the species which dwell there. Once payment is processed, you'll be automatically redirected to a page where you can download your certificate. <laughs> so you're paying. There's a picture of it, though. You could just. I could literally download picture. this and fill that in. What the fuck? There's an Uri Geller Museum, and I clicked on it. Oh, there's the picture of him leaning on the car covered in spoons. Um, and it's just all his shit. Like okay. there's a soccer ball, there's a guitar. Okay. Okay, Brandon. Lamb Island's constitution. This is not a constitution, by the way. There's nothing about this that's a constitution. Um, the first thing says, the island is friendly to all countries, peoples, and micronations around the world. The island declares itself sell, declares special friendship towards Scotland. The island declares special friendship towards witches of whom many suspects were subject to cruel trials for alleged practices in North Berwick in the 16th century and murdered and offers eternal sanctuary for the victim's troubled souls. <laughs> the island is declaring uh, 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 friendship. The uh, island. Allyship. The island. The island is special allies with Witches. both the Scottish and witch ghosts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the island declares special friendship towards peaceful extraterrestrials who may land upon or pass over the territory unhindered or use it to communicate with humankind. The official flag of the island is Yuri Geller's life logo, symbolizing nature, mysticism, and the powers of the universe. The official language of the island is all languages of the world and beyond. <laughs> oh. the official ang and the official anthem of the island is my island composed in 1909 specifically adapt especially ad adapted to become the signature song of lamb <laughs> the island adapted just means i took this now <laughs> yeah the island's laws are the laws and bylaws applied to by the neighboring country of Scotland and the Council of East Lothian before and after the date of declaration. <laughs> well, my assumption is that's because, like, micronations are not recognized and it's also within the territory of wherever that is. So he has got to be like, the laws are the laws of the nearest fucking... <laughs> Citizenship is a symbolic status which does not allow for any territorial claims or unauthorized activity on Lamb Island. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <sighs> oh boy, Yuri Geller. Anywho. Um, so apparently they, they talked to him, uh Lawrence Livermore talked to him for like remote viewing stuff because, you know, it was like back in the seventies and you know, everyone was like fucking high. You know, um, remote viewing is great because you can get the money, but also you don't actually have to go out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, no. Remote vi remote viewing is such a good scam, right? <laughs> like, oh, such a good scam. Um, <sighs> So 
Apparently, after meeting Yuri Geller, the scientists began to feel that they were possessed by some kind of tormenting, teasing, hallucination-inducing spirit. They would hallucinate flying saucers in their room, and one person described seeing a giant bird at the foot of their bed. That being possessed by a hallucinogenic spirit that it just sounds screams like screams absinthe. Yeah, or or like you know mushrooms or you know. You know, anything any, mushrooms. any of the things that people were fucking around with in the 90s and like also you're a government agency so probably the cia was fucking with you in some way you know <laughs> just dosing you this is another case of one the cia was just dosing them i mean like the cia dosed a bunch of people and we don't know how many yeah. people they actually dosed because like yeah. lsd is super cheap to produce and like yeah. they were just throwing it at everyone and seeing what happened. God, I'm just being secretly dosed with, like, government lab quality fucking... That sounds like a nightmare, I'm gonna be honest. Yeah. That sounds like hell. Didn't one guy have, like, a teacup of it? Oh, it was something ridiculous. Like, some stupid amount. <laughs> yeah, there, there, was, there was a bunch of dumb stuff happening. It was not good. Um... So, I do have to say this, that the book has the audacity to note that the experiences in both scenarios, the Lawrence Livermore and the Sigan Walker Ranch related ones, appeared to be centered uh-huh. near bedrooms, hallways, and backyards, which I like to call the house. Yeah. <laughs> How many, like, like you know what's left? The living room and the kitchen. The, yeah. The- it's the house. You've described the house. Because th- the phenomena ha- seem to happen in the areas where people happen to be in order to be able to experience them. Weird. Now. Th- so we notice there are no phenomena where th- no people were there to observe. It's very strange. It's very, very strange. Um, But Brandon. Yeah. Uh, there's a oh, bunch of. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Can, can I can I say the. Can, can I, I'm you can excited. Can say the, I, you I, can say it, the name of the section. So the, the each section has a, a part on on top of it in a uh, sixteen font aerial heading two. Uh-huh. Like it, it it's like like bigger, so it catches your eye and you know you're on a new section. And mm-hmm. this next section is simply one word, and that word is Dino Beaver. Yes, it is. So, um, about a hundred percent of the stories in this book are dumb and un- unverifiable. Um, so I'm not going to cover all of them because, uh, too many of them are like basically the same story. Um, also yeah. some are full episodes in their own right. Like the, uh, Nemizit class, uh, carrier Tic Tac UAP case, right? So like a Nemizit, um, boat, which is like a U.S. like warship saw, um, a Tic Tac U- UAP, which is like a whole thing it's probably fucking nothing but we're not going to cover it on this episode because there's a lot to talk about um because people make a huge deal out of it um but before i close out on skinwalker ranch skinwalkers at the pet in the pentagon um i do want to cover my favorite story in the book and that story begins with a too long description of military person uh juliet witt shown around the ranch that the book calls what i shit you not paranormal disneyland Oh, good. They call Skin Rocker Ranch Paranormal Disneyland more than once in this book. It's... Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't... I... Also, calling it Paranormal Disneyland implies that it's fictional. I don't think they realize that, but, like, that does imply that it's all engineered and not real. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, anywho... During the introduction, Kelleher made sure to take the time to tell her about all the findings that happened at the ranch since 1996, um, which basically means she's worthless as, like, a witness uh, as of, like, being a new person to this phenomena, because, like, she already knows where all of the skeletons are buried, so to speak, so, like, her brain will make anything into something. Um, yeah. Regardless, in the story, uh, Wit, Bigelow, and Kelleher were on the ranch sometime around midnight. Importantly... Wit had been taking HD photos of some dead livestock earlier in the day, which I mention because it becomes incredibly fucking relevant in a second. Um, <laughs> while hanging out around one of the buildings on the ranch, the group split up with Bigelow going away from Kelleher and Wit, 
Um, and when Bigelow was about 100 yards away, once again, uh, and the dogs had been, uh, they had brought were several hundred yards away. Uh, Gotta keep them away from the deep fryer. Pretty much. The following is said to have happened. And because of how batshit this story is, I'm just gonna quote it. Because, like, I can, sim- I can, I can, like, I can, if, if I, if I summarize this, it's like a sentence. But, like, I want to just take a second to read what they, the way that they present this, because it's fucking insane. Um, so, suddenly, a cone of silence descended upon Kelleher and Wit. The crickets seemed to go silent, and even the faint rustling of the breeze on the trees ceased. Turning around, they saw a creature ambling towards them from the south. It was the size of a 150-pound pig and should have been making considerable noise as it walked. Yet, the cone of silence dominated the moonlight, moonlit scene as the creature glided past within 30 feet of Kelleher and about 50 feet from Wit. To Kelleher, it appeared the animal had a series of dinosaur-like spines on its back and also spar- spor- <laughs> sported a large, flattened beaver tail. <laughs> Which I want to take a second and say, I have never looked at something that's 150 pounds and been like, oh, that should be making a fuck ton of noise. <laughs> um, Oh, God. Apparently, this dino beaver was also a level three bard. Apparently. Um, oh, God. So it noiselessly coasted past the pair and disappeared around the southwestern corner of the building. Even Kelleher, who had spent hundreds of days and nights on Skinwalker Ranch. Had already been and had already been exposed to this fair share of bizarre anomalies on this property. Felt a distinct chill as he watched the surreal animal shuffle silently away. I also want to take a moment to say that I'm like 90 percent sure Kelleher wrote this pe- chapter. So this is just really funny to me. Whenever somebody's referring to themselves in the third person while writing, I just really think that's funny. Um, yeah. So Kelleher looked at Wit, who was staring in astonishment at what at where they had last seen the creature. Quickly, as if a spell had been broken, they hurried around the corner to get another look at the bizarre beast. Nothing was visible. There was no sign of the creature. Ten minutes later, the pair were still searching feverishly in the area when Bigelow joined them. And then this is my favorite sentence. There had been no time to take photographs. No. No. Are you talking to a cat or are you talking about the sentence? Because The sentence. I'm okay. talking to the sentence. Okay, good, good, good. Because there had been no time to fake, take photographs, Brandon. Uh, once again, it wasn't. Once again, Kelleher was left feeling frustrated and baffled. And I want to point out, this person, Wit, had a fucking camera on them. <sighs> like, they literally spent... Like, like, it's literally like less than a page before they're talking about her taking photos of things. Yeah. Um, you know how everyone talks about beavers and their incredible land speed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They, they just glide over land. It's just like... <sighs> they're like ghosts, really. Um, so... They're like a ghost with diarrhea. <laughs> they're like that one... They're like that one deer from... Uh, uh, Castle Crashers. Oh yeah, yeah, you yeah, 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 yeah. You know the one that just oh, it doesn't gosh. run; it just kind of is like propelled. Yeah. Um, Wit would be plagued by shadow people, uh, giant-sized owls, and poltergeist like activity. Which I do want to take a moment to say that giant owls are like a whole fucking thing in like the alien community that I'm not gonna get into. But, like, yeah. that's a whole fucking thing. Like, people think that owls are associated with a high strangeness. But, like, I do yeah. want to take a moment to say that owls, the only reason they're associated with being wise is because they have big eyes. They are the fucking dumbest animals. The only animal that I think is dumber than an owl is a, is a duck. Okay. <laughs> they're fucking stupid. They're stupid, hateful creatures, owls. Fucking anti foul John. <laughs> I'm super anti foul. You just eat chicken out of spite. Mm-hmm. I do. <laughs> owls owls are also like puking monsters because they puke they 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 puke up pellets that have all like the bones and fur and undigestible bits. Yeah. So they can like cloaca out the rest. <laughs> um Anywho, Brandon, what happened to this program? What do you think happened? I think I told you. An adult saw it, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, 
So the authors of the book call the program highly successful. They have some audacity, okay. I got to say. Um, it doesn't produce really anything of note. Uh, the findings are almost exclusively conjecture, and the evidence that is supporting it is, like, circumstantial at best. Um, and they did just, like, a really faulty assessment of the material that they had access to. Like, really bad. Like, like we're talking... We're talking... <laughs> We're talking that one... So, I don't know if you ever heard about it. There was a sociological study that happened in, in California. Um, they, the per, This person set up two cars. One in, like, the inner city and one in a suburban uh-huh. area, right? Um, the suburban area... Like, in both areas, they set the car up. They opened the, the, the hood and, like, put, like a, like, a, like, a towel or something, like, to indicate distress or something like that. Um, yeah. And... I think they left the keys on, like, the car unlocked or something. So, it was to see what people would do to a, a like, a disabled vehicle, right? Yeah. Um, In the city, the car was basically stripped for parts in, like, no time flat, right? Um, In the suburb, uh, somebody came up, they covered the, they, like, closed the, the thing, and then they, like, locked the door yeah. and all stuff like that. And... The conclusion that the person who was running the study came to was, well, the suburbs have an understanding of car culture, um, and they under they they know that people rely on their cars to get to work and stuff like that, and the inner city doesn't uh, because they have the ability to trans like move by feet, so they didn't have as much compunction about like taking things from it. Um, yeah. which totally misses the fucking point that the suburbs are bougie as shit and the inner city has, you know, people who need money. Um, so yeah, uh, that's basically what this program, like when I think about this program, I think about that study. Um, yeah. So the program was not renewed by the defense intelligence agency. Um, and, uh, the group would then try to start the program at the department of Homeland security, but failed to get traction. Which, given what the Department of Homeland Security does, it surprised the shit out of me. Because, like, if there's a place that doesn't have proper adults, it's going to be the Department of Homeland Security. Yeah. Um, a second program would eventually manifest that was not affiliated with Bigelow Aerospace called the UAP Task Force. Um, and then this is the program that would make the UAP report you probably heard about back in, like, you know, uh, 2021. Right, the whole like soft disclosure uh-huh. thing that everyone was talking about, um, but yeah. that's a story for another day because we're done with this fucking story. And <laughs> um, the Skinwalkers at the Pentagon is such a poorly named book because never, never once does a Skinwalker show up at the Pentagon. I'm so I was so disappointed. That title wrote a, a check that it didn't cash. Yeah, it's uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's very dumb. It's a very dumb title story. Better. It's a very dumb story. I mean, Skinwalker Ranch already is a bad title. Like, like, it just it's just more and more bad, right? Yeah. But whatever. Anywho, uh, that's everything I got for for this one. Um, as always, for our pluggables, the website is cryptopediacast.com. Instagram is at cryptopediacast. So is Twitter. Um, our email is cryptopediacast at gmail.com or us at cryptopediacast.com. And we do have a Patreon. Um, and Brandon, why don't you why don't you give our our jackalopes a thank you? Yes, thank you to our jackalopes: Clay Sinclair, Marty Von Party, Bird Schneider, Lenwood Sharp, Matthew Smith, Bushcraft Kelso, and Will Smith. Chicka chicka wow! Um, so uh, if you enjoyed the podcast, uh, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, send in monster quest stories. Um, we do have a disco Discord disco. We have a discotheque. We do have a discotheque now. I might make a discotheque. Um, so we we do have a, a Discord. That's where we basically talk most of the time with people. Um, if you do have monster requests or stories, send them in. I think my next my next like marching order is to talk about Megalodon, if my memory is correct. Yes, that, was, that came up in Discord. That was very strongly requested. Um, so that, that that'll come as sometime in the future because I'm pretty sure Megalodon doesn't have any um any like issues around white people but you know I might be wrong we'll find out (laughs) 
You could find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at crypto brandon and at Heinz Canada, which I haven't used in a while. Yeah, I don't know. I think I just copied the, the copy from when you were like still doing the Heinz Canada stuff to the bot- bottom yeah, of this. I keep intending to do more with it, but then just lack of time. On Instagram, I'm at Mew2057. My Twitter is at JF Dunham. My website is johndunhamgames.com. And my email is john at cryptopediacast.com. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com. And his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. As always, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And bend a spoon to pick a piss off Yuri Geller. That true. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> That's that's our that's our advice for the week. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs>